Good afternoon, everyone. How are you today? Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here, and um, I certainly hope this discussion will be enlightening, beneficial, will inspire you, um, because I have been in the arts field more than 20 years, but I think I've loved art just about all my life. And so I very much feel and believe, honestly, that art can be everywhere. And this first slide is really the epitome of that for me in terms of all are welcome here in Raleigh. I mean, I think that's such an, a powerful social statement, but it also means all art is welcome here. And I hope this afternoon will be a discussion that's a starting point for how we can ensure that's going to happen on multiple levels. So uh, as Leslie mentioned, you got three speakers today. I'm here to just give a little bit of an overview in terms of what community-based public art is. Uh, I will not be talking about the City of Raleigh public art program and our half percent for art projects. So if that's what you came for, sorry. You will not hear about that. Uh, I'll be talking about things that have been driven by the community, um, both historically here in Raleigh, but as well as giving you a snapshot of some of the things that have happened, not only nationally, but internationally. Uh, and then I'll finish up by talking a little bit about things we've started with regards to citizen-initiated public art projects. Uh, Jed will be talking about uh, the Raleigh Murals Project, but then showing how public art has been something uh, that can also happen and be driven and placed on private places. So you'll be able to hear how uh, you can do things that's not necessarily about putting it on city buildings, but your own spaces or other spaces like that. And then, of course, Beth. Uh, we'll be talking about the facade grant. You might recall Roberta was on the agenda to speak. She could not be here today, but honestly, Beth will do a fantastic job in terms of talking about it. It is a program she manages. It's a wonderful way to see how public and private converges in terms of the city offering grants that can help beautify um, a building. So that's us, and let's get started. So for me, you know, what is community-driven public art? In short, that is public art generally is defined as art in the public realm for the enjoyment of diverse populations, which enhances design, improves the visual environment, and offers residents and visitors a heightened sense of place. Well, what does that mean in terms of what that connects to with regard to community? Pretty simple, it's all about you. So this is not about public art that's driven, led by the city. Uh, this is about you, whether you're an artist, whether you're an organization, whether you're a developer, uh, whether you're just a collective, a neighborhood group wanting to do things. This, this is really about how you drive that. So it's not just a singular entity, if you will, doing the work, but that it's all of us collectively um, working together to create um, wonderful, wonderful spaces. So what have I seen have been the common denominators about that? One, obviously, it's a desire to beautify. Sometimes seeing uh, the regular old day to day, we want to enhance it in some way and beautify it. Two, uh, it's about conveying a message a lot of times public art has its um, foundation in wanting someone to share information that's personal to them to be able to convey it visually um, to others. Three, to take the utilitarian and beautify it and transform it. That could be a street, that could be a wall, that could be a utility box. Again, it's about what we can do to take something that may be ugly, Let's be honest here uh, and turn it into something that is beautiful. And then, of course, to create an opportunity for place and to be able to say, hey, let's go meet at that parklet on Hargett Street. I mean, it's a, a wonderful way to be able to, to take us and transform us beautifully um, by way of art. So I thought I'd share first some examples that you might be familiar with, may not be familiar with, that have happened globally. 
and I'm sure, has, has anybody ever seen the AIDS memorial quilt or are familiar with it in any way? It's a, it's a really simple project that started back in 1985. Um, an individual wanted to honor the thousands that had died as a result of AIDS in San Francisco as a part of the march. And instead of those folks being numbers, they became names. So they wrote the names down on placards and they carried those names in that march. That in turn transformed into how we could identify them by way of quilts and remember them. Uh, and then of course it transformed into thousands and thousands of quilts that still travels today. But that was driven by individuals, that was driven by community to be able to share a message, um, but to also use a wonderful craft, quilt making, um, in order to do that. And some of you might have seen Raleigh's version of the Before I Die. If you've been to Art Explosure, anybody seen that yet? Art Explosure or at uh, SparkCon. Well, it started not with us, uh, with Candy Chang, an artist in New, New Orleans who uh, had a friend pass away. And so for her, she wanted to somehow remember and have an opportunity for others to share their thoughts. So she took this um, vacant building in New Orleans and put up these signs um, with these lines that said, before I die, dot, 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 with the line. And this would allow people to share their thoughts. And it became incredibly popular. She in turn decided to make that a project that could happen nationally and internationally. So it has been shown everywhere, not as something where the artist is going to cities and is creating these walls, but she has on the website, here's the template for how you do it. Just follow these rough parameters and you create this in your own neighborhood. So it's incredibly empowering that it's not so much about generating it from one person, but that she has in turn turned it into something that can be shared by everyone. And then there's other projects. I love this. This is actually a, a grain silo uh, that is used for rock climbing. Clearly, if it was all white, it was probably looking very plain, but this artist decided, I want to paint it. And he started his own uh, what do you call that, the funding, the crowdsourcing opportunity for him to be able to, to, to paint the silos. And this was an opportunity in Australia where a teacher was working with her students. It was just a, a boring fence and she t decided we we're going to create it and turn it into art. So they just put fabric and wrapped it around it. I love this project because uh, this was a graffiti artist who knew many folks have a bad perception of what graffiti is. And he decided, especially for his grandmother, to make sure she understood what graffiti was. Why don't I transform this into doing birdhouses? And so he used the studio first to create these art elements um, that has since then transformed and been done in many other cities where birds use it. It's a beautiful way for him and for others to be able to create art on their walls. But he started it because he felt like, let me try to find a way to show that graffiti in different forms could be good, ironically. And uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about murals because Jedediah will be doing this, but I just thought this was an interesting example in Pittsburgh where it actually started as a competition with the Rotary Club. The Rotary Club decided to have folks, artists, submit applications or artwork, 12 by 24 inch pictures of mural designs. And then the community had a contest to select the finalists. And then from there, they provided a little bit of money to the artist as well as help from other artists in order to put up mural, a mural in a site. 
and street art. Uh, we see that everywhere and often in this way, in this particular example, they were using the street art in their neighborhood in order to just bring folks together. There had been issues uh, within the neighborhood and the community and they wanted to find a project that would allow them to be able to come together as a group. So it was strictly neighborhood painted in terms of what they did. I'll talk in a little while about another project that we've done here in Raleigh. And then, of course, talking about the mundane and beautifying it, utility art boxes. You know, we have a lot of those around here in Raleigh. Hmm. Uh, but this is an example of how it, it was driven by others. It's not the city driving it, but driven by others to come up with a way to paint those utility boxes. And here, I just thought this was cute because it was about libraries and I believe I've actually seen a couple of those little free libraries here in Raleigh but what a great way to take those houses those mini houses those libraries if you will and and turn them into art objects as a part of your front yard and of course the, the one on the left someone actually took a tree stump and transformed that into a library and then I love talking about the fact that, and I see this a lot in Greensboro, but here, this is one that was done in Durham, where you take a, a vacant building, its facade, and transform that, give it to an artist for them to be able to create art um, as a part of that. So, and I believe there'll be some things you'll see here soon, hint, hint, uh, by the way, about that kind of work. So what about Raleigh and kinds of things we've been doing? So here, I've got a picture of Sir Walter Raleigh because I feel like this is kind of the first project that was community driven. If any of you know the history, it basically started as an opportunity to create a statue of our namesake, but it started with kids gathering pennies. Now mind you, that fundraising project took about 75 years mm -hmm. to do. But it really started with those kids. But now, it, in my eyes, it's become another kind of community-driven project because folks love to decorate it. So, you know, Sir Walter is transformed depending upon the event and the occasion. And it becomes something new um, with each opportunity, which I love. And so, of course, you guys remember this on the L Street building. This was something where Empire Properties owned the parking garage and wanted to beautify it. They did a contest with NTSU design students, and three fabulous design students were selected to do this project. And have those murals ended up going to another space where you can still see them? It was a gorgeous project. And then, of course, um, the best, the Raleigh best that everyone sees next to the Union Station construction site. But it was just a wonderful way that uh, brought together a number of artists and many, many volunteers um, to do a lovely long mural that was about Raleigh and a number of the significant folks here in Raleigh and the idea of um, transportation um, and the trains here. And I put this one in because it wasn't until yesterday that I actually knew who the artist was. The artist's name is Marlon Ferguson. Uh, it's, a, it's a mural that's been here since 1992, but I've been here six years. So this has been a piece that has always eluded me in terms of who did this piece, but I also see this piece as something that has been magical because I often see folks who are using it as photo opportunities as a part of what they're doing. It's a mural that's been here a long time. And yes, I would love to figure out ways that we could figure out how to repaint it. But I'll also say I do think there's something intriguing about how it looks now. And then the street art that I've seen popping up here uh, in downtown Raleigh in particular, the left piece by Matthew Curran, the right piece by Sonia Rose, where it's just taking some empty vacant door and, and installing art in the most unusual places. 
at our bike racks. There's all kind of bike racks that uh, a number of folks have either uh, been doing privately, and I, we ch I cheated a little bit on this one. There's a couple of bike racks in there that were actually uh, driven by Urban Design Center working along with, um, I believe, Habitat for Humanity to do a design contest um, for that. But it's just nice to see how it's placed everywhere um, in any place. And I, one of the, the lovely, most popular ways that folks have been doing um, their own thing is to chalk art as a part of the street festival every year uh, in Sparkon. And then the Glenwood South Neighborhood Collaborative, who also were the ladies who uh, did the best Raleigh mural, they, they led that project as well, did this fantastic project on Glenwood uh, that was about working with church groups to knit sweaters, if you will, on the trees. And then from there, those sweaters and scarves uh, were donated um, to different organizations. And uh, one of the latest and greatest uh, lovely little uh, pop-ups is the park mural, the parklet mural in front of Deco Raleigh, which um, was a great private endeavor, long time in coming, mind you. Um, but once it has been installed, she has been using different artists to paint murals um, on the front of that. And it's a very active, vibrant space right here. So, so the city, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the city is doing in terms of helping to empower, if you will, with regards to doing public art projects on city property or on what we call the city right away. And so just know there was a, a policy that was passed in 2014. We were getting requests from folks saying, we wanna do things on city pro property, but we really didn't have a plan in place um, for how to do that, uh, which we finally do. It was something that was reviewed by the Raleigh Arts Commission and by the Public Art and Design Board. And it was essentially about outlining steps for what that process might be. And then, of course, um, coming up with how we would administer it um, afterwards. With the goal being down the road, we can also potentially fund and help with doing that as well. But let me stress on this particular um, slide, it's how we can empower you. And it's a new program, but how we can empower you in a way that is the uh, least effort and allows us to get the art out in the quickest way possible. So, a couple of projects. Our first project was one with Art Space. Art Space wanted to paint the pedestrian tunnels that were opposite the center. Um, and so they worked with us to get approval for the lovely um, painting of this, these murals on the pedestrian tunnels that were in front. Our second project is the one I think most everyone is familiar with and knows about. And again, it's the uh, Glenwood South Collaborative. They were interested in painting their crosswalks. That was this simple discussion that started with their desire to see how the city could help with maintaining safety um, on Glenwood. A lot of the crosswalks had been faded. And so they felt, well, if we turn it into an art project, perhaps that will be a way for us to get crosswalks down um, in this area and help with that. So um, we worked with them on the process of what it would take to get them to paint the crosswalks because one thing they made distinctive on this project is they very much wanted it to be driven by community. They did not want the artist to necessarily take the lead on painting. They didn't want the city to take the lead. So what we also realized as a part of this project in terms of lesson learned, because it did take well over a year for us to get from that initial coffee meeting to finally having the celebration for this, um, is that with street projects, it's much more complicated than you might think. It involves a lot of fe federal regulations and whatnot. So there was a lot of concerns with regards to risk management, with regards to um, legal, to ensure everything was done right. Um, but I will say this, what came out of that was a discussion with the city to realize that these projects um, will be great 
And so something that took us as a part of uh, a year, over a year long process with those crosswalks, ended up turning into a process where city departments became very familiar with what was coming down in the pipeline. And so something that took over a year for our next project took us no more than two months to get done. This was a project that Cam Raleigh did um, on the, as a mural on a building that was going to get torn down at Union Station for the construction, but we wanted to just go ahead and beautify it in some way and just have it as a brief, wonderful opportunity for folks to see art at the site. And it was enjoyed for, the, I believe, the month and a half that it was there. What's next for us is this. Some of you might have participated in our Raleigh Arts Plan. It took two years to do it. We have a plan, it's been passed. Uh, it's a, a vision for the next 10 years. For me, the two goals that pertain to what I do in this eight goal document is goal one, which is about promoting an active arts and culture throughout the community and goal Five, enhance the vitality of Raleigh's neighborhoods and districts through thoughtful placemaking. That means it's all about you, again. What can I do to empower you? What can others in the city do to empower you? So that if there are opportunities that, are, that we can do that happens to be on city property, city right of way, we want to give you the tools, the mechanism, the facilitation, if you will, to make it something that's wonderful. Because I also know we're a city of innovation. And if we tampen that innovation, that's a problem. So um, that's one of my main goals. Now what I'm going to do is turn it over to Jedediah so he can talk about um, the things that he has been working with regards to the Raleigh Murals Project. Kim asked me to speak at this um, mainly because uh, the projects that I've created over the f past few years have kind of been outside of the government and kind of uh, attempted to kind of rethink the reality of how urban projects happen in the city. And through the Raleigh Murals Project, Kim and I have started working together um, pretty closely over the past two years. And, and so it just kind of makes sense to have people that are inside the government, outside the government, start to talk about these um, issues and one thing I realized um, when Kim was was speaking was the fact that almost all the projects she's shown today have all happened within the past five years which is really cool to see that um, for lack of a better term synergy in the past few years um, I think the Sir Walter Raleigh statue is the only one that's you know slightly older than five years um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project that I created about two years ago um, and kind of a little bit of its history, what it's doing now and where it's going. Um, but first I want to talk a little bit about a project that um, I kind of really hold dear to my personal heart, um, mainly because um, I worked at Clearscapes back in between 2005 and 2000, wait, 2005 and 2009. And um, I got to work on some really um, kind of boring projects like she showed you the beautiful Sir Walter, Sir Walter Raleigh statue, but no one knows that I drew the pedestal that's down below <laughs> and had to draw that. So I went from like mundane projects like that to being tasked as a, like a 26 year old to design this massive public art project. So I was the lead designer on this project and I worked closely with Thomas Sayer and Steve Schuster and uh, a few of the other folks at uh, Clearscapes to come up with several ideas of how do you take um, what, what is a, if you don't know what's behind here, it's all the mechanical systems behind um, this. So Thomas came up with this idea, borrowed from an artist named Ned Kahn, to create a, a, a mural of sorts, a public art project that would then uh, kind of become a symbol for our city. And so we went through a lot of design iterations. And I think that this kind of, between this and my love of artists like Banksy and living in L London for a while and seeing street art everywhere, I kind of got this kind of um, idea to, to kind of kickstart some, some urban art ideas. And so I, I also run a project called New Raleigh, which is this weird hybrid news media personality thing. And so 
I started noticing about two, it was exactly, exactly two years ago, 93 weeks ago, that um, I realized that there are a lot of vacant, kind of simple uh, facades around the city. And with my background in architecture, I kind of noticed these things, where doors are, where windows are, nice facades, bad facades. And so I started this just simple campaign through the kind of, again, to connect what um, was mentioned earlier, my kind of media background with my architecture background. Um, a hashtag campaign of just where we could rethink um, putting murals in our, or how could, we, how could we rethink the facades in our city? And so this became a kind of a fun little project to go find uh, facades around the city that I thought could um, be more beautified with, with, with art. And so you see there was a handful of those that kind of went within that kind of, I guess it was kind of several weeks. And then uh, a friend of mine came to me and we had lunch over at Bidamanda and he said, hey, I'm really not crazy about my job right now. I'm kind of itching to do something different. Do you have anything that, that, that I could work on with you? And I said, well, there's this hashtag that I've been working on. Um, how about we turn it into a project? And so based on the Richmond Murals Project and a handful of other cities in the country that do these kind of, kind of collective community-based art projects, we started um, the Raleigh Murals Project. And at first we kind of fumbled into this because both of us have no artistry background. Well, I guess I do a little bit, but we're more in interested in the city itself and making, making the city more colorful. And so this was actually one of the first times that Kim and I worked together on the Shaw Mural Project uh, that they pulled us in the Urban Design Center and we all kind of sat around a table with the president of Shaw, or the soon to be president of Shaw at the time and just started coming up with ideas of how we could take these two walls and turn them into something really beautiful. Well, so, um, actually the artist Lisa's here, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. so Lisa uh, actually did this and it was kind of a pre-mural. So we're, we came up with this idea of doing a mural before doing a mural, uh, before they raised all the money. So this was a mural that was done to raise money to do another mural, which we thought that was just such an interesting way, a lot like the, the mural that was over here that Bart Cusick did that then was torn down. So murals don't have to be this permanent thing. They can be very temporary. And, and over time, then we helped them put out a call for artists and what came of it was the mural shop out of Chapel Hill created one that was more historically, uh, was more historically kind of, um, it's a historic narrative to tell about the 150th anniversary of Shaw. And the other was kind of more of a fun uh, kind of collection of aspects of the, the city from technology to trees to the skyline. And so if you're going down Blunt Street, you can kind of see both of these on each side. We just thought it was a really nice way to kind of create um, this urban kind of corridor where a lot of people walk on here. It's kind of a gritty kind of weird area. I know they're wanting to beautify it because the sidewalks are small. It's just, it, it helps to add more kind of beauty to that aspect of the city. And so as, as we were working on this project, uh, we set up a website and did the, we're both actually media strategists and with kind of side interest in art. So we, we did all the social media and uh, website first. And then uh, the, the woman who, her name is Carly Marlowe, who works at NCMA, had actually written the first article on us, came to, came to me and said, hey, let's throw on some ideas for the new Escher exhibition. And so what the murals project started turning into was this idea of collaboration and us becoming kind of middlemen in a way of kind of helping not only create ideas but also connect artists with business owners. And in this case, we uh, sat down, I sat down with Carly and we came up with this idea of you, they can't use Escher's art. So therefore how could like imagery as part of the um, branding and marketing material. So how could we kind of think outside of art and think outside of the mural uh, to create something. So what we created was a handful of a kind of a network of Escher quotes around the city and um, we and so in this case we played kind of designer as well as middleman because then we found all of these spaces and we then allowed each one of the building owners to choose the quote. So these aren't quotes that, that were mandated. They actually had a, a series of 30 quotes that Escher said that each business owner was able to uh, kind of match to their own personality. So um, most of these are still around, and um, we also try to think a little bit outside of 
um, the wall itself. So both the ones you see here, kind of this one's on a wall, this one's kind of in a weird area when you go down Capitol Boulevard. We started thinking a little bit outside of that of where can art go that's not simply, you know, just a big wall. And that's something we're experimenting right now with a few different ideas of how big murals need to be. Can they be like little micro murals or can they be, wh what can they be? Can they be text? Can they be on fences? Can they be on floors? Um, and in this case, it's on a door, it's you open up and you kind of split the mural in half. So, um, so this is a really kind of one of our first projects to kind of get this project going. And it was, it was very successful, the arts uh, are still around. And, and what I really like about this project is again, there were seven or eight different business owners, an artist that we found, his name's David Eichenberger, who created this font, particularly from Escher's old wood cuttings, but this is the first time a font was created out of Escher's art. And then we were able to work with um, the NCMA too. So it's kind of a, a, a kind of a network of sort of collaborators, which I think is kind of where we're attempting to move with this project as well. And speaking of collaboration, um, so as this, this is actually one of the most recent projects, but as it's kind of going on, we get a lot of uh, solicitations and people from businesses to events to artists wanting to be part of the project. And so um, most recently, Cameron, who's, who's here from Arts Pleasure, came up and was like, hey, I really want to do a mural. Well, I'd also been talking to the owners of this building about potentially using this building as a, as a canvas for art. And so it was a really kind of nice way to kind of connect someone like Arts Pleasure who wanted to do this potentially temporary mural We'll see how long it lasts relative to how long this building lasts. And also figure out a way to make a situation like this, which is kind of an interesting gateway into downtown, much more beautiful. And so we work with Arts Pleasure in this case to kind of, um, luckily they had an artist. So in this case, it was more connecting them with the business and then helping to come up with some ideas. And so we, similar to NCMA, Cameron and I sat down and came up with a handful of ideas of what this could be. Um, they had an idea, we had an idea, and we kind of set it on a middle idea, and there's potential that this thing could evolve over the years as well. So um, another aspect is that because our Explosure is a community-driven event, and because what we are driving, or what we are creating is hopefully a community event too, Cameron and I worked together to find a lot of volunteers to help uh, Lisa, who's, who I mentioned earlier, paint this. And so rather than, rather than it being a simple artist and taking a lot of time because there was not a, you know, a massive budget for something like this, it was community-based. And so over two, over two days, well, we sent out some calls to several people who had uh, wanted to be involved. Cameron did the same and basically just people showed up to help on this mural, a lot like the Glenwood South best murals and, and the things they're doing. We think this is a really good model for the future of having more murals in the city, having an artist drive the process uh, of creating the mural, but potentially getting a lot of help because these things take a lot of time. And so you can see the final mural here. It's located just a few blocks east of here. And there's some cool ideas for the future of this mural, um, how much of it will stay. We'll see how that goes. But um, regardless, it's a really cool way to take a, a simple, you know, kind of wall that's kind of falling apart and turn it into something that becomes kind of an icon. There are, are now uh, running shops and businesses and fashion shoots starting to happen in front of these things because it becomes, it becomes a backdrop. And so from there, um, a few months ago, I was contacted again because of this project by a friend who worked with this artist up in New York and said, hey, there's this really cool opportunity. And so with this project, it was, it was a lot of the ones that were community driven. This was kind of more of a bigger, and we also want to go this direction too, which is bring in other artists. We want to support local artists, but we also want to put Raleigh on the map by having internationally acclaimed artists come to our city. So in this case, it was a, an artist named Kevin Lyons who is out of Brooklyn, and he is basically in charge. He was in charge of Urban Outfitters for a while. They're creative. He was their creative director, and um, he also worked for Stussy, and a few other big brands. Um, and he was working with uh, a group called Truth, which Truth is a, a uh, anti-smoking campaign for teens. And so we really like this idea of, again, community-driven, uh, this potential of this project having a really good um, kind of community effect, especially on teenagers and lowering smoking. So they came to us and say, we have this idea. And so, again, soliciting kind of spaces 
there weren't a lot of walls that people were really interested in doing things in the city. So I had to jump back to the folks at Petrovia. It's like, hey, I know we've used this mural or this wall, but this one's perfect. Because we searched all around. We're working with a, an agency in LA called 72 and Sunny, and they had specifics for the size of this mural. Went to a lot of different uh, building owners, and we came back to this one. So unfortunately, this Escher mural um, kind of had to go, but for good reason. And what was really cool about this art, uh, this um, project is uh, Kevin is who you see in the middle um, and then we were able to bring in David Eichenberger who's a local artist into this project and so the two of them worked together um, to create this again Kevin drove the process and had some had David come out for a day and help him touch up some stuff so I think this is a really cool way that uh, again we can get national artists um, and local artists learning from those artists who've done I mean Kevin does murals all over the country all, all over the world really and then What's really cool about this is there was another layer of this project, which is not only is it about truth, but it's actually there's a shoe that matches and it's sold up at Urban uh, Journeys up at the city. So it was this really cool collaboration project we couldn't turn down. And we just think that this is the type of project that we want to see in our city, not necessarily from a branding and marketing perspective, but for that it has big kind of it's a big art statement. You know, this is about ending smoking. So. Um, and again, uh, this is what it looks like. Um, the guys at Trophy are really cool because they're starting to put art around their building. And um, again, to combine what I was doing with my architecture with media, um, I also helped make a video, which I don't know, if, is it gonna play or? This is just a quick ad that we made for Vans for this project to just show how this is kind of, this is shown in every Journey store in the country, by the way. So Raleigh is getting some really good kind of press for its murals. So that was produced by Myriad Media, which is where I work by day. Um, and so something else we worked on, I'll just touch on a few other things briefly, but this is in the HGTV Smart House. It's up in uh, North Raleigh. It was just featured on TV a few weeks ago. We helped them hook up with an artist because they wanted to do a mural in their, um, in their workout room. So we're trying to create these situations where people come to us and we're able to just hook them up with artists and get artists jobs, you know, in this non-profit situation that we have. It's not even a non-profit, it's just two dudes and a computer. Um, and so what I'm trying to do with this too is try to do more urban projects that are just not only murals, but again, to think outside what public art could be. Again, this is Myriad's office and we put up this kind of equality rainbow um, for Equality NC a few months ago. And then when the Panthers played, you know, we kind of did this very simple statement to try to just think about facades in, in a new way of how we can just kind of push, put up and take down art. And art can be temporary, art can be permanent. And, um, and so this is, um, well, I'll show this video, this is a murals video that now we're creating to kind of make a bigger campaign out of this and say that, you'll watch, sorry. So we believe that you know there's a lot of colorful characters in this city and so we believe that the city itself can be as colorful as the people and so this is a campaign we're going to be rolling out over the next year to just help again to bring more art and bring more artists to the city. 
And the last thing I'll talk about is a project that is so New Raleigh spawned the Raleigh Art, Arts Arts, Raleigh Murals Project, and then the Raleigh Murals Project spawned this project that I'm now working on with Pam from Deco called Flight. And so one of the issues we find in public art is money and funding. And the city runs into that, private investors run into that, everyone does. And so Pam, who runs Deco, which is a block over, created the parklet. I had had the murals project. We got together and we're like, hey, how can we find money for these things? And so Pam has a background in fundraising. And so she's like, let's raise some money. And I said, okay. And so we are, so we created this thing called Flight. Flight is a, an urban, creative urban art foundation that will basically raise money. We had a pop-up shop and we raised $10,000, you know, taking 10% of the proceeds out of that. And we're then taking that money and just throwing it right back into the community. And so over the next year, many years, but we've got two or three projects about to debut. Um, in the next few months, we're working with art space and the city and local artists, and we're just kind of helping to take money that we've raised and create projects that we think are, again, thinking outside of what the art we see in this city. So check out Flight, um, and I think Beth is going to come talk a little bit about the Urban Design Center and the Facade Grant, which the great thing about the Facade Grant is, again, finding money, and I think that that's one of the biggest issues with art these days. So thanks for having me. So um, I'm Beth Noy and I'm a designer with the Urban Design Center and I'm here to talk about the Facade Grant which uh, Jedediah just mentioned about funding. Uh, so we had all these wonderful projects that Kim and Jed went through and uh, we of course as a city would like to see these things happen and uh, now we have an opportunity to actually make it happen. So we have an existing program called the Facade Grant um, and it's actually a program that we've had since the 1980s. And um, originally it was for um, providing development resources for properties in the downtown dis district in the pedestrian business overlay districts. Um, it, it provided additional funds for areas and major construction areas, uh, for example, Hillsborough Street and Fayetteville Street um, during the reopening of Fayetteville Street. It also provided funds for city market renovations that went through. Uh, we have assisted over 120 businesses and actually awarded one million in funds. And uh, the facade grant is basically based on a community development statute, which is to um, target lower moderate income areas and to cure blighted or restore positive economic use in um, businesses and buildings and the restoration and preservation of existing buildings. And so this is an example that we had on Fayetteville Street, which is now the foundation and the Raleigh Underground. Um, as you can see, it was a major improvement. So the facade grant actually provides money for signage, awnings, um, facade improvements like um, new painting or a brick repointing and so forth. Um, we recently decided to expand the program a little bit more to encompass some of the new goals that we had for the city. And we are going through um, an update that we'll go through in July. And so these two couple update updates will be um, expanding the eligible area, and then also to incorporate elements such as murals and art on facades. So as you can see, the little purple blob at the very bottom, that is what was eligible before for facade grants. And the blue area, which is a little bit harder to see, maybe I can pinpoint some of that. You can see it expanding up um, through the corridors, um, Capitol Boulevard and New Bern and Southern Gateway area. Uh, we expanded it. Um, probably like four or five times over and we are anticipating that this will actually target some of the economic development areas that we originally wanted to um, provide for the grant. So for elements, the new elements, we're going to incorporate art and murals and um, Meredith is here. This has been shown several times but we figured that this is a very appropriate mural and um, what will happen is that we don't quite know, we're going to be working through this as we go along, um, what appropriate art or mural will be, but this is an appropriate mural that we think. So the couple things will happen. Um, we will actually um, require art and murals to go through the Public Art and Design Board for approval, um, but it should be eligible for all the funding that previously the facade grant uh, provided, which would be up to 50% of the mural or art 
cost, which would be up to $5,000. And uh, the changes will be made in July, like I said. And if you're interested, uh, you can go to the facade grant webpage, which you just go to the City of Raleigh website, um, put in the search engine facade grant, and it'll pop up on our webpage. Application is there. Um, if you have any questions, I am the project manager, and you can call me. I have some information in the back. And I think that is all. <laughs>